There's plenty of space on the other side of the room, so if you're uh, looking for a place to sit, more space is over on the left or the right. You know what time it is? Okay, good. We're ready to start. So um, I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth uh, annual Black Hat briefings held here in Las Vegas. Uh, this is the second year we've been back at Caesar's Palace. You notice the place we were at last year got uh, blown up. This is where we'll be for the next couple of years. It's much nicer and larger, I think. Uh, we have a lot more speaking space, so we don't feel as crowded. Um, it's been a busy year since I saw everybody last. I think uh, some kind of bubble burst somewhere and uh, made our life a little bit more interesting. But this is going to be the largest black hat ever as far as uh, new material and speeches and presentations. And uh, you can tell that because you're here an hour earlier. Normally I start at 9, but uh, to fit everybody in, I had to start an hour earlier. Not my preference, but uh, it's sort of out of necessity. Let's see. It's um, hopefully going to be the most technical black hat ever. I'm going to try to, each year and at each show, increase the technical content until I achieve my uh, fantasy goal of alienating about 20% of you in each room. <laughs> so, I figure if 20% of you kind of shake your head and go, what the heck just happened? Um, I've achieved my goal, and it might drive some of you to uh, go out and, uh, and learn more. Uh, it's no fun when you understand everything that's being said. So uh, I'm doing this intentionally. Um, let me see, we're going to continue to expand the Black Hat Briefings name. We're going to be holding our Win 2K show next one in New Orleans right before Mardi Gras. And uh, we're doing a show in Amsterdam uh, that's going to have tr more training before it. And we're going to continue in Asia, probably in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, and we're contemplating maybe a show in South America. We've also launched uh, Black Hat uh, Consulting. And we're going to do more trainings in between shows, initially out of Seattle. So you can get training in the near future, not just at our shows, but also in between shows. Let me see, the network is up. It's an 802.11b network, and we've got coverage mostly on all the floors. And if the door is open, you can uh, get it in here as well. 10.0.0.2 um, .0 is the message board and schedule update site. I've posted some signs around. Um, I know some people initially started using it as a resume uh, repository. But uh, you can do with it whatever you want. Um, just don't insult anybody or start flame wars. Um, for people who don't have a wireless connection, there's going to be a hub by the secure computing booth and a power strip and such. So if you need to plug in your laptop, there's, a, I think, a 25-port hub there. Um, remember, it's a hub and not a switch, and you probably want to try to encrypt everything you can. <laughs> I don't know how many people are running, uh, you know, Etherpeak and Etherspoof and Ethersniff and... Let's see, final notes. Uh, like a movie theater, I ask everybody to please turn off cell phones. Um. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, and at the, uh, there's a 6 p.m. gala reception uh, tonight. And at that reception, uh, Jim Bamford, the keynote speaker, will be doing a book signing. Walden Books will be here to sell books if you don't already own it. Um, if you're interested, then he can do a book signing with them. Uh, we've got a lot of questions about that. And then also during the gala reception, Wynn Schwartow will be trying out, beta testing his new ethical survivor game. First time he's ever tried it. So uh, he's going to test it against you guys. Uh, I think that'll be in this room while the reception's out there. Um, let me see. O'Reilly was kind enough for, to provide us with shirts and uh, signed some signed books of Database Nation that... Uh, Hopefully, each speaker will be giving away a, as a prize to somebody in the audience during their session for uh, best question asked or uh, you know, best uh, insight or whatever the uh, speaker comes up with. We're going to try to incentivize the audience to participate more and to bribe you. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all to Black Hat. Um, and I want to introduce the first speaker, if uh, Jim is around. You saw him at the Win2K show, if you showed up. He spoke about uh, the, his history of creating his first fantastic book about the NSA, The Puzzle Palace. Um, but his Body of Secrets book was still not published yet, so he couldn't really talk about the specifics in that book. Uh, instead, he told uh, fantastic stories about how uh, Ronald Reagan passed a couple of executive orders to prevent him 
from doing uh, continued research in certain areas. So in this book, he's um, come around, he's found ways around those uh, uh, presidential decision directives and uh, has created this new book. And I'm sure soon there'll be new laws preventing his research methods um, to prevent him from writing a third book. But with that said, I'd like to introduce Jim Bamford. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me here. As Jeff said, I just did a new book. It's called uh, Body of Secrets, The Anatomy of the Ultra-Secret National Security Agency. Um, what it does, it takes a look at NSA from the, uh, through the Cold War. My first book, The Puzzle Palace, started back with uh, World War I and brought it forward. And this book here um, basically looks at NSA uh, during the Cold War and especially since the, uh, the period of, the, of time since The Puzzle Palace came out. Um, just to give you a little background, when I began writing, I graduated from law school and didn't want to practice law. Uh, I wanted to get into writing. And I was looking around for a topic to write on. Uh, there have been scores of books on the CIA. And I wanted to write on the intelligence community. There had never been any book on NSA. Um, and after I started looking into it, I realized why. I mean, it was extremely hard to get any information on the agency. There had never been any other books written before that. And um, uh, NSA, uh, as many of you probably know, is very shy. They don't like to... Uh, to uh, uh, come out very uh, very often. Last night, if uh, any of you stayed up, uh, uh, Nightline did a piece on my book. And uh, it was supposed to, we were going to have this, this piece come out a, a, a couple months ago, but it took all this time to finally get NSA to agree to uh, uh, appear on camera. Um, when I began work on the Puzzle Palace, I didn't really even have an idea how secret NSA was. And I started to get that idea. Uh, uh, especially after the book came out. I mean, not only among average people, but even among people in government. Um, when my book came out, I had to do a book tour, and one of the people on the book tour was uh, uh, that I had to share a TV show with was uh, Senator Bill Bradley from New Jersey. Uh, he was going to be on the show to talk about the economy, and I was going to be on there to talk about my book. So we shared this uh, taxi ride over to the studio, and he said, what's your book about? And I said, it's about NSA, the National Security Agency. And he said, what's that? So <laughs> I ended up uh, briefing this Senator Rhodes Scholar uh, on the way in the taxi on the way to the studio. And then when we got on the air, the first question the host asked me was, uh, how secret is NSA? And I just couldn't resist it. And I said, uh, even Senator Bradley said he'd never heard of it. And uh, we were supposed to take the same taxi back, but uh, he decided to leave, leave without me. And the next day, his aide called me up and said, uh, that was a pretty below the belt uh, hit you uh, did on the senator last night. And I said, uh, I just tell him the truth. I mean, he's supposed to know what the government's all about. And I said, if I wanted to hit him below the belt, I said he would have probably said he, he uh, probably confused it with the NBA. Uh, so, Obviously, I've never heard from Senator Bradley again. Um, then when the book came out, uh, again, doing this, this book tour, uh, when you're giving talks different places, you sort of sneak into these bookstores and see, make sure your book is in there. And I went in and uh, a number of bookstores, and I'd look for it. It wouldn't be in there. So I'd go up and say, you know, do you have the Puzzle Palace? And, and the clerk would say, uh, well, yeah, we've got five copies or whatever. And I'd say, I don't see it. And they said, well, it's right back there in the puzzle section. So <laughs> that's why I changed the name of the new book here. Um, and even the Book of the Month Club, uh, you know, every author wants to get on the Book of the Month Club, and they put your little jacket on the back of the, uh, back of the New York Times book review with all these other famous books and all that. And so I looked at the back page of the New York Times book review, and there it was, my little jacket. But it said, uh, the Puzzle Palace, a report on NASA, America's most secret agency. <laughs> and the, uh, the ad agency that put it in thought I had made a mistake on my book, because they'd never heard of NSA. And they voluntarily changed it. So for a couple weeks until it was changed back, I think uh, at least I probably got a few sales to astronauts who probably never would have bought it beforehand. <laughs> yeah. um, 
what Jeff asked me to talk to you about basically is uh, researching NSA, how I went about getting some of the information. I, I don't know how many people know much about NSA. Just I'll give a little background on what NSA is for those who don't know too much about it. Um, first of all, it's the largest intelligence agency in the world, uh, uh, about twice or even larger than that, uh, twice larger than the CIA. Um, it specializes in signals intelligence, eavesdropping. It's the world's biggest ear. It eavesdrops on communications all over the world. A lot of those communications, as you uh, assume, are uh, encrypted. So the second major responsibility is breaking codes. And the third responsibility is uh, making the US encryption system. Um, one of the big controversies now involving NSA is Echelon. Um, Echelon is the, basically it's a code word for this uh, system uh, that links NSA and the five major, uh, NSA and the other major English speaking countries of the world together uh, to form a, a major worldwide eavesdropping um, uh, organization. It's known as the UK-USA agreement and after World War II the United States, Great Britain, um, uh, the uh, Australia, Australians, the Canadians, and the New Zealanders all got together to form this very secret organization uh, to collaborate all their eavesdropping and co-breaking activities together so that Australia would, uh, because of location, could eavesdrop better on Southeast Asia and uh, the UK could eavesdrop better on um, uh, Europe and so forth, and they all share it together. And that's gotten uh, the Europeans very worried now, now that the Europeans have come together in the European Union. Uh, they're very worried because they're afraid that NSA and all these other uh, countries are spying on their economic information and, uh, uh, and giving it to US competitors. Um, so that's one of the major controversies involving NSA right now. Um, now, in, in terms of uh, doing work on, on, and one other thing, uh, uh, just to bring NSA back into the news, there, there was that plane that went down on Hainan Island, that ET. E that uh, had the mishap in the air with uh, the Chinese fighter and, and went down on Hainan Island. Again, that's NSA. NSA, even though you don't hear about it every day, has planes out um, uh, flying along coast and eavesdropping on communication. So it's, it plays a major role around the world, uh, even though you don't hear about it every day. Uh, now, in terms of getting information on NSA, it was a it was a uh, a real challenge. Uh, if you were going to do a book on the CIA, um, there's a lot to start with. You've got all these other books. You read the books. You find out who's talked to these other art, uh, authors. Uh, you read articles. Who's talked to the Washington Post? And you at least start with those people. And then they would, you ask them to recommend somebody else to talk to you and so forth. Uh, there wasn't such a thing with NSA. There was virtually no articles. There were no books. So uh, I had to be creative in almost everything I did in terms of trying to get information. And to a large degree, there's a, there's a, uh, a lot of comparisons between uh, hacking and what I do. I mean, hackers try to get forbidden information electronically, and I try to get forbidden information uh, through bureaucratic methods, uh, uh, going through documents or finding people. Um, but to a large degree, I mean, the, the principle is the same. The information is very hidden, and you've got to find creative ways to go out and get that information. Um, so finding people was, uh, was a very difficult problem. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of my biggest successes in finding people was uh, um, there was a, NSA has a retirement society called the Phoenix Society, and I found one person that I, I met in looking for people, I found one person that had a, uh, 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 this uh, booklet and it contained all the former, or many of the former NSA employees. It was a retirement association. So that was a major advantage. I found that book and it gave me locations and names and so forth. So that was a big help in terms of getting locations of people. In terms of documents though, documents were very, very hard um, because NSA, unlike almost any other agencies, uh, immune from the Freedom Information Act has a thing called Public Law 8636, subsection 6, which I know by heart because I submitted so many FOIA requests to NSA and get the same letter back saying, under Public Law 8636, subsection 6, we don't have to give you this information. 
And what that law says basically is that uh, Congress shall create no law requiring NSA to divulge any information about its organization, function, structure, personnel, salary, or any information basically other than its name. Um, so that was pretty tough. I mean, what am I going to do? I, I, uh, I've got this uh, thing that makes NSA immune from the Free Information Act. Well, one of the things I did was um, in, in searching through uh, uh, what are known as manuscript collections. These are where people leave their pa papers to someplace else. In other words, if I die, I'm going to leave all my papers maybe to the University I went to or something. Well, one of the founders of NSA was William F. Friedman, and he left all his papers to uh, uh, this uh, place called the George C. Marshall Research Foundation. And um, uh, in going through his papers, um, I came across the NSA newsletter. Uh, the NSA newsletter uh, uh, was a wealth of information. It's published every month. It talks about internal activities. It doesn't go, it's unclassified, so it doesn't go into, you know, what, uh, what the latest eavesdropping system is. But it talks a lot about what's happening at NSA, who the people are, and what's going on. Uh, so I really wanted to get a copy of that, and I submitted an FOI request to NSA, and they said, um, um, under Public Body 636, you can't have it. Uh, but in reading carefully the newsletter that I did get, uh, it was in William F. Friedman's file uh, at the Marshall Li George C. Marshall Library, it was when he retired and kept his newsletter. And in that newsletter it said, the contents of this newsletter must be kept within the small circle of NSA employees and their families. And um, one of the few advantages of having gone lost law school, it sort of uh, struck a bell when I, when I read it. Uh, the last three words, anyway. Uh, it said, and their families. Because what that did was, uh, by putting those last three words in there, they've opened that newsletter up to a group of people outside of the agency. They've opened it up to people who don't necessarily have security clearances, to uh, people who, uh, whose only connection is uh, consanguinity to some, somebody that works there. There happened to be a, a relative of some sort. So I argued uh, to NSA that, um, look, if you've opened these newsletters up to a category of people outside of NSA employees, then you've got to open it up to me. I'm as good as somebody uh, uh, just because they're a relative or something. In fact, I'm better because I'm coming in asking for these documents under a congressional act. Well, they had never heard that argument before, and it sort of floored them. Um, and uh, within a week, I got a call to come down and meet with the general counsel of NSA. And uh, they were very worried, and I said that, look, if we go to court, I'm certainly going to win uh, on this argument. And not only am I going to win, you're probably going to lose Public ID 636 because you've waived it for the last 25 years and giving these uh, newsletters out. So um, uh, the general counsel asked for another meeting, and uh, uh, I went down there. And this time, I had a list of what I wanted to trade, uh, sort of uh, horse trading. I would if, uh, if you drop your, your lawsuit, or I hadn't filed a lawsuit, but if you, if you agree not to sue us, basically, and, and go to court over this FOI request, uh, we'll um, um, give you something. So I asked for a few things. I had a list. I wanted a tour of the agency. I wanted the entire internal structure. I wanted interviews with, all, with uh, senior officials. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had a whole list of all these things I wanted. I figured maybe I'll get one of them. After I went in there, and it was Valentine's Day of all things, they uh, they said, "Okay, uh, if you drop it, we'll um, uh, we'll give you everything you asked for." So they did. They gave me the tour, the interviews, uh, the, the internal structure with the names and the titles and everything. It was amazing. Uh, what I didn't tell them was in the and what I had to give up to get that was uh, um, not request the names of uh, of people above uh, a certain level uh, or, or below a certain level. In other words. Uh, I would get the whole newsletter, except they would delete the names of people below a certain rank. Um, um, and I really didn't care about that anyway. Uh, so I got virtually the, the entire, um, everything I asked for. And it was a wealth of information. Uh, if you take that information, the information in the newsletter for 25 years, from 1952 until the, about the time that I, I got the, uh, the newsletters, uh, and you put it all together, you really get a good picture of what's going on inside NSA. Um, well, that was how I got a lot of that information, the a lot of the internal information. Um, and again, it was forcing NSA to give this to me. Um, um, a lot 
obviously uh, very reluctantly, but they wanted to avoid court and they, they ended up giving it to me. Um, one of the other ways uh, uh, I had to be somewhat unique in getting information was uh, I used the, the, uh, uh, these manuscript collections, as I mentioned. Um, uh, most people don't realize it, but there's a lot of information out there in um, university archives and other places that where people, like I said, have left, uh, left their um, uh, papers. And um, when I went to the George C. Marshall Research Library, one of the things that really frustrated me was going through William F. Friedman's papers because um, um, he had left all his papers there in order to get them away from NSA. He was one of the founders of NSA and he was one of the founders of American cryptology. Um, but the, um, um, he had a big falling out with NSA at the end of his career in the late 50s because uh, NSA uh, ever paranoid, I mean they're extremely paranoid about uh, information getting out. They even suspected Friedman may be uh, secretly stealing secrets, so they actually raided his house one time, um, which didn't make, uh, make uh, uh, Friedman very happy. So after that, instead of leaving his papers to NSA, he tried to get them away from NSA and left them to this George C. Marshall Research Library. Uh, well, when I went down there and started going through his papers, and I was only the second person to go through it, um, I found all these withdrawal slips from NSA saying, this document has been withdrawn uh, uh, um, by the National Security Agency. This document has been withdrawn. So I started talking to the archivist down there. And again, this is not a government organization. This is a uh, private library. I say, well, you know, what's the idea here? Friedman put his papers down here to get them away from NSA. And these aren't, uh, these were personal letters that were pulled out. These weren't government documents. They were personal letters after he had retired. And so I, basically convinced the archivist that, look, your job is not to serve NSA. These, these things have never been classified. Well, your job is to serve William F. Friedman. So he agreed and he opened up all those papers to me. So I had access to all these papers that NSA had pulled out and NSA had no idea about it. So I got a lot of that material. And then um, while I was there, the archivist said, as long as you're here, do you want to see the uh, George C. Marshall, uh, I mean the uh, Marshall Carter papers? Marshall Carter was a former director of NSA. And I said, you mean he, he left his papers here too? And he s said, yeah, and, and nobody knew that. NSA didn't even know that he left his papers there. Uh, so I, was, I thought I was in a dream there for a while. So I had access to all these papers and, and Marshall Carter had taken all his, all his office papers. They were all unclassified, but he took them, all the unclassified papers out with him. He kept them in his basement and then uh, uh, when he became president of the George C. Marshall Foundation, he donated them all to the to this uh, library, and so I went through there, and there was an amazing amount of uh, documents in there. Uh, among them were, were personal letters from the director of the uh, GCHQ, uh, which is the uh, the British equivalent of NSA, um, to uh, uh, Marshall Carter, and they never and these were handwritten, and there were never any classification on them because the director of GCHQ. You know, obviously never assume that the letters are going to be put in a public library or anything. So, so they happened to be in there and I got copies of these letters and they talked all about the cooperation and so forth. Um, they're very, very valuable. Um, well, uh, when the uh, book came out, NSA suddenly realized that I got gotten access to all this information. So NSA, uh, um, uh, first, they did, uh, first thing they did was they sent a, a bunch of people down to the library and ordered the librarian to put all that stuff back in the vault. And then they went out to Marshall Carter, he was in retirement out in uh, Colorado, and they um, ordered him to uh, uh, close his collection, otherwise go to jail, basically. So he shut his collection down immediately. Um, so all those documents that I quote from in, in the Puzzle Palace, or a lot of them uh, that came from this place, are no longer available. Uh, as a result of the um, actions, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, the American Historical Association, American Library Association, a number of other groups all sued NSA, saying you can't go into a private library and start pulling things off a shelf and ordering kept secret. And the end result of the suit was, uh, was a sort of partial victory for either side. And some of those documents did get put back on, but a lot of them did not. And Carter's papers were never have never seen the light of day again. Um, one of the, the most uh, serious uh, uh, 
problems I had in terms of uh, documents. Uh, uh, again, this was with the Freedom Information Act, was trying to get um, information on a, uh, on a very secret investigation that had taken place into NSA. The Justice Department in the mid-70s conducted an extremely secret investigation of NSA's eavesdropping capabilities. Uh, and the fact that they were probably breaking the law by eavesdropping illegally on American citizens. Um, the, they conducted this internal investigation and they even read Miranda rights to senior members of the NSA. Uh, eventually they decided not to do the uh, investigation um, because um, uh, too many secrets would be revealed even though they did found, find probable cause that, that uh, crimes were committed. Um, all that was very secret though and I submitted an FOI request to the Justice Department for any documents related to that investigation. Um, and it took about nine months, but then the Justice Department, I was extremely amazed, it was sort of like throwing a, uh, you know, you're fishing, you just sort of throw the, uh, uh, a, uh, a hook into the water and just wonder what's gonna happen. And they actually released to me uh, a lot of those documents. The, they had redacted some material. Um, and again, it was amazing to me, but NSA didn't know that. The Justice Department did it without ever asking NSA's uh, permission or anything. And they later said that it was uh, on the principle that, uh, you know, if you had requested Al Capone's or, you know, uh, John Gotti's uh, uh, criminal file, they wouldn't go and ask John Gotti's permission before they would release it to me. It had to do with what the FOIA says. So when NSA found out, they uh, demanded the Attorney General try to get the documents back from me. Um, but this was the same Attorney General, Civiletti, who had released them to me, so he didn't even uh, pay no attention to NSA's letter. Um, well then, uh, the Ronald Reagan came into office and, and uh, much more conservative uh, attitude and the Attorney General was William French Smith and this time Bobby Ray Eman, who was the director, went to, uh, to William French Smith and said, Bamford's got all these documents, we've got to get them back, this book's going to come out and so forth. And so uh, William French Smith uh, agreed to go along with it and I got this phone call from the Justice Department saying they'd like to have a meeting with me. Um, and at that point, I mean, it's not every day you get a call from the Justice Department wanting to meet you in Washington to discuss something. So I got a lawyer in Washington, one of the best national security lawyers, and, and um, uh, a guy named Mark Lynch. And uh, we had the meeting, and they explained that all these documents had been released to me by accident, and that they wanted them all back. <laughs> so um, I wasn't really, uh, uh, I didn't want to, give any answers right then and there. I just allowed it to think about it and so forth. And then uh, we had another be meeting. This one was gonna be up in Boston where my publisher was and where I was living. Um, and this time, um, uh, senior officials from NSA came up and, and senior Justice Department lawyers came up. And I was just gonna tell them, no, I'm not gonna give them back. You know, it's a bad precedent. You can't have one administration give you documents and another administration try to take them away. It's a real bad precedent. Uh, but they got very agitated and they started saying, how many copies have you made? Who have you given documents to? Um, and so forth. And I said, well, you, you know, it's not on the agenda today. You're just gonna ask me whether I was gonna give them back and I was gonna say no. Um, so you gotta call, <laughs> call up my lawyer, Mark Lynch, and ask him these questions. And so I started, I could hear them on, on my side of the, on my side of the, the phone. I'm, hearing the NSA guy, or the, actually the Justice Department guy talking to my lawyer. He starts bringing up the espionage statute and everything else. So Mark Lynch says, uh, why don't you put the phone back on its side and, and uh, wait outside and let me talk to Bamford, wait outside the conference room. So I got on the phone and Mark Lynch said, uh, um, you know, they're getting way over your head. I, they could have a, I don't know what's in their pocket, they could have a subpoena or a summons or a warrant for your arrest or whatever. And um, because there is a section in the, in the espionage statute that says if you incidentally or accidentally come into possession of uh, classified documents and refuse to give them back to their proper custodian, you can be charged under the act, which is like 10 or 20 years uh, in jail. Um, and uh, so it was fairly serious. So Marklin said, uh, my suggestion is put the phone back down on its side, go out, tell them I wanna talk to them, them again, and as they're going into the room, you just disappear. So. <laughs> So I did, I just uh, left. I actually went up to my editor's office and, and waited there and until they left and they had to sort of find their way out of the conference room because uh, I had asked 
the publisher not to have anything to do with this. I would meet with them alone. And they found their way back to Washington, and then they started sending me letters saying, you are currently in possession of classified documents, and re we demand their return. And we kept sending a letter back saying, under the executive order on secrecy, uh, it says once a document's been declassified, it can't be reclassified. I mean, it's fairly simple. You don't need a law degree to understand that. And um, they continue to send letter letters back saying, this decides that, or, or you know, forget that. We want the documents back. <laughs> and, and we just keep sending the same letter. Well, then President Reagan changed the executive order on secret to say once a document's been declassified, it can be reclassified. But they couldn't apply it in my case because it would have been ex post facto. In other words, you can't create a law to punish somebody who's done something beforehand. So, so um, uh, then after the book came out again, they tried to prosecute me a uh, second time, uh, or they threatened to prosecute me a second time, and uh, because of all the information in the book, but again, the Justice Department uh, took a look at it, looked at uh, my back notes, uh, about 100 pages worth of back notes, showing where I got all the information, and there was no grounds to bring any charges. I did it all legally. So after that, they sort of went away, and that was the end of it. Um, and after that, then I, uh, I uh, went and did a lot of other things in journalism. I wrote for magazines, uh, wrote pieces for the New York Times Magazine and other places. And then ABC hired me to be the uh, investigative producer for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, and I did that for about 10 years. And then um, and the Monica Lewinsky story came along, and I thought it was time to go back into writing again. I, I really <laughs> couldn't handle it. Um, and so that's when uh, my publisher had been after me to do a new book on NSA, and, and uh, so I decided to uh, you know, go back and do a new book. And uh, on this new book, Body of Secrets, uh, again, I, uh, well, I left the ABC in April, I think it was, of 1998, and then I, I approached NSA, and I said, look, I'm going to do another book on NSA, sequel. Can I have some help this time, you know? Cold War is over. Uh, it's been 20 years since my last book or so. Um, and again, I got this hard, uh, this uh, uh, stonewall treatment again. Oh, we can't give you interviews. We're not going to give you a tour. We're not going to do anything. You know, too bad. So I said, okay, well, that was the attitude last time. It didn't stop me from doing a book. I'm going to go ahead and do the book again. And, uh, and then about a year, and then that director left, and a new director came in, uh, General Hayden, Michael Hayden came in. And, and, about, uh, and then I approached him, and again, I got sort of the same treatment. And then about six months later, um, I'm still working, uh, sort of middle of working in the middle of the book at this point. And, I got this call from um, the uh, director of protocol at NSA, a uh, person I never heard of before, and they said, she said, uh, uh, the director was wondering whether uh, you and your wife would like to have dinner with him at his house. <laughs> so all of a sudden, uh, everything changed, and uh, the director sort of saw the benefit in, uh, in cooperating, and, and uh, I had, you know, 700 pages to fill, and I was going to fill it with you know, whatever information I got, and NSA was not going to have a voice in the book if NSA didn't cooperate. So I agreed to, uh, we sort of uh, talked about ways that we could be, uh, you know, NSA could be somewhat helpful. Uh, originally, they wanted, a, NSA wanted some kind of a deal, like a quid pro quo. If we help you, we want to have an opportunity to look at the book or check it over or whatever, and I, uh, and I just wouldn't allow any of that. So. I said, if there's going to be any help, it's got to be a one-way street. And so they eventually agreed. And, and, uh, and the um, director gave me a number of interviews and um, uh, gave me, I got, again, I got tours all through the agency again. Um, uh, and I was able to see you know, how NSA had changed over the years. And I interviewed a lot of uh, senior current officials over there. Um, and um, uh, the newsletters, uh, Newsletters were easy to get now, but after the last time, after the Puzzle Palace, they watered them down so they weren't very useful. So this time I had to come up with some new idea um, and uh, using the Freedom Information Act. And so I had heard that NSA did these uh, oral histories. Um, and one problem I had is I couldn't get any of these former directors to talk to me or deputy directors. But I would heard NSA had done these oral histories. and. Um, so I submitted a request, a FOI request, for all NSA's oral histories. And it was amazing because they had tons of them, and, and they had 
uh, oral histories from all the former directors and deputy directors. The only problem was they were extremely highly classified. And it would have taken me forever to battle for those. So I just requested all the unclassified paragraphs. And there were a fair amount of those. There was maybe 20% in each of those uh, 100 pages. So when I was, and, and this took an awful lot of fighting and battling with NSA to get this information, but it was extremely useful. It gave me a great insight into what was going on. Because if you read those oral histories, they had no idea any of that information would ever be made public. It was very funny when, uh, a lot of times a director or deputy director, they be they sit down with this NSA historian in their office at NSA and they would, the uh, uh, first question is, uh, well, this is uh, gonna be kept very secret, isn't it? And the historian would say, there's no way this will ever get out of here. I mean, this, <laughs> and so there was a lot of gossip in these things. Not only uh, uh, a lot of information on operations, which they, were able to keep from me, but when they were talking about why they picked this deputy director or why they didn't like this head of operations, that all had to be in there because it wasn't classified. So it was a, a wealth of information. Um, and uh, using the FOI request, I got a lot of other documents. NSA has a lot of internal publications, and again, using that same philosophy of just asking for the unclassified portion. Uh, I was able to expedite it, and I, I was able to get a great deal of information. And a lot of times, if uh, if you get this paragraph, and this one's secret, and this one I got, and this one's secret, you could read it, and you could sort of read between the lines a lot of times and sort of figure it out. Um, uh, one uh, other factor that I've, uh, I've got to mention here, uh, and then I'll take a, a questions, is, uh, is the um, issue of luck. I mean, luck is always very important in this uh, in doing these type of things. And uh, it's a lot of it is luck depending on how hard you're working at it. And you really gotta work hard at this and then you know luck sort of comes along. A couple of lucky things that happened this time was um, um, I requested a lot of uh, uh, these tapes, these uh, videotapes of like these history conferences NSA has had. And, e and that was hard to get, but I got the, the, these tapes. And one of the things I, and they were all unclassified, and, and th it was sort of open to the public, some of these history conferences. Um, but one of the things I always do when I get a tape uh, is I play it right to the end, these, these videotapes. And lo and behold, they didn't erase one of those videotapes. So, so they had this internal conference, or this internal, internal discussion at the end that was never supposed to have been on the tape in the first place. And it was a wealth of information. I got a a lot of good information. I don't know what the classification would have been, but when it was given to me, it was unclassified, so. Um, yeah, that's sort of an idea of how I got some of the information. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions if uh, anybody has any here. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I'll repeat these questions because I probably can't hear them all. Uh, the question was, uh, um, what's the incentive for NSA, or why do they do that, just classify paragraph by paragraph instead of classifying, classifying the whole document or the whole page or whatever? And the reason is that there's a regulation that says they have to do that because each paragraph may be a different classification. One may be unclassified, one may be secret. And um, um, uh, a lot of it has to do with the Freedom Information Act request, and, and uh, um, they've got to know what the classification of each of these uh, paragraphs are. I mean, um, so they do it, and, and before each paragraph, you'll see a little parentheses, and it'll have like a U or a TS or a TS slash C, top secret code word or whatever. Um, and uh, that's why they do it. Uh, it. There's a regulation that says they have to do it. So anytime you get, almost any time I've seen classified documents, they do it paragraph by paragraph. Uh, any other questions here? Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, can you hear? Were those ever what? Oh, uh, um, you mean money on the book or? or? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, uh, yeah, the question I do with uh, the 
benefit profit motive for doing books pretty much and uh, whether I made any mo any money on doing this and actually doing the the puzzle palace uh, uh, I had just gotten out of law school I had never I had never written a thing in my life and um, um, when I first went to this publisher they thought I was talking about a novel since they had never heard of the National Security Agency and so they uh, gave me a, a an advance of uh, they agreed to do the book, actually the first publisher I went to, which was kind of amazing. But the advance was $7,500, and I ended up spending three years on it. So um, it, it was a very risky proposition um, uh, because the, uh, you know, it could have not sold any. It eventually it became a bestseller, and this new book has become a bestseller. So um, I, I did make money on it, but it's, it's a risky venture anytime you go into these things. Um, yes, sir. Uh, the question is, do my books make NSA's job more difficult? I'm um, sure it does. Um, uh, but, you know, this is America. You know, this is uh, uh, a country where people are allowed to write on different things. If this was Russia, they would have just, uh, Russia in the old days of the you know, Communist Party and all that, they could have easily just uh, had me arrested and put me away for life or whatever. But the whole difference is that uh, the whole thing is this is a different system. So, yeah, I mean, my... What I do makes NSA more difficult, but the, I'm not doing it for the benefit of NSA. I'm doing it for the benefit of the, the public out there. You know, and the follow-on question is always, uh, you know, am I giving secrets away to help the other side? Uh, um, the answer is no. Uh, the, uh, the information I get comes from NSA, almost all of it. Uh, I have to, uh, you know, I have to beg and plead and, and uh, harass them in order to get the information, but most of it comes from them in the first place. Uh, the Russians don't get their information from, from me or from other journalists. Uh, I've been writing on intelligence and doing television pieces on, intelli on, on intelligence issues for 25 years, um, and I've followed the, the, the spy cases very closely. Uh, they get their information from spies. They, uh, spies. they get it from, uh, from the people who are, are you know, turned traitor for the agencies. One of the people I happen to know, um, uh, when I was in Washington, again, I was the investigative producer for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. So I had to do all the, um, I had to do a lot of interesting stories involving espionage and scandal and all that. Um, so I'd meet a lot of people. One of the people I happened to meet uh, in doing this work was uh, uh, a guy at the FBI named Bob Hansen. Uh, and we became very good friends. Uh, uh, we, uh, he was at my wedding, even, uh, um, and uh, he was really the perfect spy, at, at least at the time, because he was uh, extremely conservative. He was always trying to get me to do uh, stories on uh, Russian infiltration into the United States and uh, um, uh, always trying to get me to go to church. I mean, it was kind of amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, uh, last February, I start reading the New York Times and I see a headline, uh, major spy arrest, and I saw Bob Hansen's name there in the corner of my eye, I saw his name. I thought, well, that's great. He made a big spy arrest. And so I read a little closely, a little more closely. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't he that was making the arrest. So, um, uh, so that's where uh, the Russians get a lot of their information. If you read uh, the indictment of Bob Hansen, for example, uh, most of the counts had not to, were not dealing with the FBI. He wasn't really that much of a damage to the FBI. His major damage was to the NSA. Most of the information he gave away dealt with the NSA, um, including the, the tunnel under the embassy and uh, how the NSA broke codes. And, and uh, The bottom line of that is that uh, uh, the intelligence community has got a real problem on getting too much information to new, too many people uh, in the loop because they shouldn't have had access to that information. Um, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so the question has to do with uh, whether NSA is, uh, is trying to build up their, um, um, uh, you know, sort of, it's what a lot of agencies are doing. They're, they're, it looks like, you know, these agencies might not be uh, so useful anymore after the Cold War, so they're trying to make, uh, make up reasons for them to stay in existence. And to a large degree, uh, that's true with NSA and other agencies. Uh, they're, they're 
focusing now on, now the Cold War's over, they're focusing on uh, terrorism and all these other problems, and there's a question as to whether that's, uh, you know, really valid or not. I mean, I think NSA is very, very useful and very helpful, and we should keep it up, and, and, uh, and uh, but the, uh, the question is whether, whether the information, whether the money we spend for NSA could be more usefully spent elsewhere, and that's one of the biggest problems for NSA now. Um, I think uh, I got a couple more minutes, and I'll just take one more question, and that'll be it. Yes, sir. Oh, the question was, how's my file with the government? Um, well, after I did the Puzzle Palace, I submitted an FOI request for my file at NSA. And at first they tried to hide it from me because they, uh, um, instead of putting it under my name, which is what they're supposed to do and legally obligated to do, they put it under a code name called Esquire because they had a law degree, I guess. So they, uh, so they said first I had no, there were no documents in my file. And then I found that uh, a document with that word on it, Esquire, and I said, well, give me the Esquire file then. And all of a sudden I got a huge drawer full of documents. <laughs> uh, and they had every TV show I'd ever been on, every radio show, transcripts of it all. It was a great um, clipping service because they had <laughs> they had every uh, newspaper article, and and it was it was really interesting trying to f see how they're. Tr uh, it was like seeing the other person's uh, 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 cards as they were playing poker. You could, I knew what my moves were, but now I got to see what their moves, their counter moves were, and all that. So it was very interesting, um, and I may do it again this time. I'm not sure. So um, anyway, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your coming and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go into general breakouts in about 10 or 15 minutes. And um, so all the way at the end of this hallway is the deep knowledge section. And behind you is the technical. And behind that is the more technical, the uh, tools of the trade and the white hat tracks are going to be almost directly below us. Thank you. <laughs>